السلام علیکم ویورس ویلکم ٹو دا سیونتھ لیکچر آف انٹرنیشنل مارکیٹنگ سبجیکٹ ان ڈیسیزن میکنگ اف وی ریئلی ٹارگیٹ ٹو میک گڈ ڈیسیزنس رائٹ ڈیسیزنس دین اٹس امپورٹنٹ فار اس ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ دا سچویشن کلیئرلی کمپریہنسولی and completely only then we'll be able to make right managerial decisions or any other decision so first prerequisite and an essential prerequisite for giving good management performance for making right decision is to inform ourselves unless we inform ourselves properly we cannot expect ourselves to be able to make right decisions best decisions part of the process of informing ourselves is to learn previous knowledge previous experiences what people firms societies have done previously and what were the results if we do not inform ourselves with these previous knowledge or previous experiences then there can be two issues one straight away we may not be capable enough to do the best management to make the best decisions may not be able to make the right decisions another problem would be that we may be going to square one that something some issue or some problem that has been experienced previously and people had made decisions and the outcomes were clear and if we do not make ourselves aware of those outcomes and face a similar situation then we might be taking all the steps from square one to make the scenes and to see the outcomes so the wise thing and the more appropriate thing especially in today's very fast paced complex modern business environment is as a first step to make ourselves aware of previous knowledge so that when we encounter a situation where we have to make decisions managerial decisions then we take businesses we take firms we take entities forward not backward in time and we make wise decisions learn on previous experiences so with this perspective we started discussion on theories that attempted to explain why and how certain firms from certain countries are more successful in international markets than others in the last 2 300 years businesses have existed some businesses have been successful more successful than others and then managers and scholars in various times in the last 3 400 years have observed these firms and businesses and environments researched these phenomena of success and failures in international market and proposed their theories or explanations as to why certain firms are more successful than others in international markets why countries from certain countries are more successful in creating firms which are more successful in international markets what are the fundamentals and situations and environments that are required essentially to groom firms that can eventually become successful in international markets so in our previous lecture we studied key 
country based theories. They started out with the earliest 16th century philosophy of mercantilism, which proposed that success of a nation lies in building its holdings of gold and silver. In today's time, we call it a reserve of a nation because gold and silver, though they are still precious, are not the only medium of exchange in today's world. Now, countries hold what we call as reserves based not just on gold and precious metals, but also a combination of strong world currencies which are convertible. So, basically, these are convertible mediums of exchange for trade. So, even today's time, nations are considered to be more economically successful, which are able to build stronger reserves of foreign currencies and precious metals compared to other countries. So, this mercantilism approach and philosophy still prevails. But then we observed that that was not sufficient enough to explain the success and failures in international markets. Because if the countries followed mercantilism, they would favor their export firms, subsidize export ventures, at the expense of domestic firms. So, one sector of economy would prosper at the expense of another sector of the economy. And hence, not all the economy of any country would prosper. And our previous experiences has also shown that two things are required to move hand in hand economic development, industrialization and domestic market sophistication. We have seen ample examples in our previous history in this world that countries which excelled in industrialization, but their domestic markets lagged in terms of sophistication, eventually those in countries and their economies were not successful. We have also seen countries where domestic markets were more sophisticated. There are still countries around in the world where a number of their people or citizens work in other advanced countries. Philippines is just one example where many Filipinos work in advanced countries in one area or another, in hospitality, in medical services and in other services areas. Many Filipinos are employed in developed and advanced countries. So, they are exposed to modernities, they are exposed to brand and sophisticated consumption. So, from attitude perspective, average Filipino is much more advanced and sophisticated, but then their domestic industry and firms are not advanced, not developed. That brings down the overall economic prosperity. So, we can see steady success stories only where the industrialization and economic development is going hand in hand with local market sophistication. That there is continuous demand for high value added products and services in the domestic market, which is helping the firms to create sophisticated products and services, which they can eventually sell in international markets. So, if you adopt the mercantilism approach by promoting only the export sector, at the expense of domestic consumption and domestic sector, then the domestic market will lack the sophistication. And local market sophistication is going to lag behind the sophistication of export firms, which is eventually going to pull down the advancement in export sector. So, certain aspects of the society would be affluent, but then other people who are involved in domestic trade and business would lag behind. And the country eventually would not be as successful. So, there was a flaw or shortcoming in this theory to explain completely the success of nations and firms in international markets. Then in 1776, Adam Smith proposed a theory of absolute advantage, addressing the shortcomings of theory of mercantilism. And he proposed that no, supporting export sector at the expense of domestic industry is not the best way 
to promote on sustainable basis the economies of countries and the wealth of citizens. Adam Smith per really promoted the aspect of free trade and suggested that to sustain economic development and growth, the countries, the policy makers must focus only in those areas where uh, the nations have competitive strengths and advantages. And not to adopt a policy of promoting exports at the expense of domestic sector. So according to Adam Smith, if the countries really want to maximize the well-being and the wealth of their nation, then they should focus all their resources and energies in such industries where these nations have relatively stronger competitive advantages compared with other countries in the world. So he advised that he has seen the countries which are focusing only on industries where they have advantage, they are able to develop those industries on a sustainable basis because they have advantages. And if countries attempted to focus on industries where they don't have any advantage, then naturally such industries cannot compete successfully in international markets and cannot become a source of enhanced wealth and success for the nations. So this theory attempted to explain in a better way why certain firms in certain technology areas, certain industrial areas, certain business areas are more successful in certain countries than firms in other areas. But again this theory also failed to provide a total explanation of success because larger nations which are also successful industrially were having advantages in many areas. And if they had focused uh, their limited resources, so resources and capabilities are always constrained. They are never unlimited resources, unlimited capital, unlimited human resources, lands or other resources available to anyone, to any country. They are always constrained. So if countries attempted to focus uh, these constrained resources into all areas where they may have comparatively more advantage than other nations around the world, then perhaps they are not making the best choices. Because out of so many areas where a nation, a large successful nation may have advantages, there are areas where they have opportunity to earn more profits, opportunity to add more value than other areas. So naturally, a nation can create more wealth and prosperity. Firms of that nation can earn more profits, can be more successful if they choose to only concentrate in areas where they have an opportunity to add more value compared to other areas where their opportunity to add value is less. So employees of a firm become rich, they get more salaries, firms get more profits and eventually the economies of nations grow faster. If the firms are able to add more value for a given fixed units of inputs. So the theory of comparative advantage was proposed in early 19th century, which further refined the earlier two theories of mercantilism and theory of absolute advantage proposed by Paul Brookman. So this theory of comparative advantage then identified that it is better for the, firm, for the firms of a nation or for a nation to concentrate in areas where they have comparatively more advantage. And the theory went further to identify even those areas where a country may have comparatively more advantage than other areas. And those areas would be where there is abundance of such factors of production which are essential for that type of industry. So in a country where the, there are many people living, the abundance is that of human resources. So it is more appropriate for firms, for the nation to concentrate in such industry which are labor intensive. Because of the abundance of labor, the labor will be cheap. 
and hence such industries can be more successful compared to other countries where the population is less. Similarly, if a country has abundance of raw materials, for example, oil or minerals, or certain country have gold, others have silver, or any other raw materials, or agriculture raw materials, like we have cotton, then more appropriate for industries to focus on such areas where this raw material is essentially consumed. So, like in our country, when a lot of cotton is being produced here locally, the abundance of cotton makes the availability of cotton ensured and also cheaper. So, if industries focus in areas where this raw material is an essential input, then there is a natural comparative advantage and the firms can sustain and can grow strongly even in international markets. So, hence more advisable and sensible for countries and firms if they are in Pakistan to focus on textile sector which uses cotton as a raw material which is abundantly available locally. Another theory, the country similarity theory went on to add on the explanations of these three theories and suggested that the firms of one country are more successful in another market which is more similar to the first market, the market of the home country of that firm. So, if the firm is from an advanced nation which is industrially advanced in certain aspects, it will be more easy, more viable for that firm to first expand into another international market which is more similar in terms of advancement in technology and requirements. The reason is that in that foreign market which is similar to domestic market, there will be demand of the similar products in a similar way and hence it is easy, it is more viable for firm to first expand in that area. For example, if firm is producing specialty chemicals in an advanced nation and wants to expand its business to foreign markets, well, less likely that such demand may exist in, in poor and developing countries and more likely that such demand may exist in more advanced nations which also require advanced chemicals. If a, if a company is in aerospace, and wants to expand internationally, then it is more viable for that firm to expand in such advanced countries where not only there is a strong demand for its type of product and services, that means aerospace products, but also the essential inputs are there in terms of highly skilled, trained, techni technical people and technology is available and the environment is available in terms of laws, rules and regulation. For a capital intensive industry like automobile industry, it is more meaningful to expand in a country where not only there is a demand for such products, but also there is availability of essential capital. It takes billions of dollars to start production of even one type of automobiles. So that amount of money is needed. And if that is not available, if interest rate is very high, because of shortage of capital, crunch of liquidity in certain markets, then it is not possible for firm to raise huge amounts of money efficiently and invest into capital intensive projects. So, together these country based theories, the mercantilism theory, the theory of absolute advantage, the theory of comparative advantage, the country similarity theory helps us to find a comprehensive explanation about the situation and the environment in which firms of any country can become successful internationally. So, managers can learn from these theories. If they are policy makers, they can adopt a proper policies. If they are managers in firms, they can make correct decisions, correct strategic decisions, correct managerial decisions about the firms with respect to their international business, international marketing aspects. In the last 50 or 60 years, especially after Second World War, we have seen another phenomenon unraveling very, very strongly. 
is the weakening national boundaries as far as businesses are concerned. The world markets were very heavily protected until 1920s, 1930s, even up to 1940s. And at very high level of trade and tariff barriers to protect their domestic firms. But then after Second World War, these barriers of trade and these protections came down decisively and significantly and substantially. Today, the trade and tariff barriers and such protections are much less, much, much less than they were 20, 30 or 40 years ago. And they are still falling very rapidly. Today, the world is much more free. As a result, now in global markets, international market, competition is not along national boundaries as was the case before 1920s and 30s. High tariff barriers and protections isolate domestic markets from international scene. So any firm when it has to go into foreign markets, if it is start to operate in a foreign market which is where the country where there are high import, export tariffs and barriers, then competition is essentially within the market of that foreign country. But in today's time, especially with the advent of WTO, there can be no discrimination between foreign and local firm to start with by the WTO member countries by virtue of the most favored nation clause which binds every WTO member country not to discriminate against any foreign firm and to extend same privileges to every foreign firm which that country has extended to any foreign firm. So essentially the markets have opened up. These barriers have really crumbled down. So they are little if any national boundaries when it comes to international competition. So in modern times of today, the competition is not across national boundaries, but it is across industrial boundaries. The competition is essentially in the auto industry. The automobile firms are competing with each other worldwide. The competition is, is among electronics industry, where manufacturers of televisions and household appliances and equipment are competing globally across industrial boundaries. The competition is essentially in the IT industry, in the computer industry, where computer manufacturers and IT manufacturers are competing with each other at global level. So in new phenomena is really enhancing the role of the firm. That is the firm which really is instrumental in creating the value which we have been discussing all along. And it is these firms, if they are successful, that overall economy of the country will be successful. And in the last century or so, really the firms have grown and grown to become huge multinationals in a large way. Now there are many, many multinational firms around in the world, which have their internal economies much larger than economies of many large countries around the world. So there exist many firms which have economies much bigger than the economies of our country. It's a very large country by international standard and huge economy. The gross domestic product of Pakistan is hundreds of billions of dollars. And there are many multinationals which are having sales of hundreds of billions of dollars in petroleum sector, in retail sector, in technology sector. And if that combined with their purchases to describe their total economy, they are huge multinationals with huge resources. 
their capability is unprecedented now to, to compete in world markets. The previous theories that explained the country policies, the country situation and environments in supporting international businesses, international firms for international markets, but it really ignored the aspect of the firm. There are many firms in the same market, but some are more successful than others. If you take United States as an example, it's a large country and very successful in terms of international business. Many of its firms have been very successful in, in entering global markets and dominating global markets in auto industry, in aerospace industry, in, 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 in other technologies, in computer industry, even in agriculture products in research, in services. But then some of its firms are more successful than other firms from the same country. So the country based theories were not able to explain this difference. They were able to explain why certain countries are more successful or why firms from certain countries are more successful. But these theories were not able to explain why from within the same environment certain firms are more successful than others in their pursuits in international markets. So we needed more explanation, more theories. And hence the firm based theories, which recognize the role of the firm in exports and imports. It brought in, these theories brought in new aspects, which determine success. The aspect of quality, the aspect of technology, patents and copyrights, the firm which is able to achieve better quality in terms of products and managerial practices, perhaps were more successful in domestic market and overseas market compared to other firms which were lagging behind in, in quality aspects and technology aspects. Firms which were more successful in research and development were able to innovate better and hence more successful than their counterparts belonging to the same country. Similarly, the firms which now hold patents and copyright protection to their assets, intellectual assets, then other firms just cannot copy. And if these patents and the copyrights are essential requirements to manufacture any successful product, then no competitor can manufacture those products unless they are able to acquire legally the rights to use those assets, the technologies and the concepts. In modern times, the aspect of brand has become very important. Many brands have countries of origin that we consume products, for example, fast food, not that perhaps it's only a good fast food, but also it has American origin or Western origin. Similarly, we consume many fashion products because they have Italian origin. Italian design or made in Italy, that is essential to describe uh, the, the quality and the brand. If any other brand in fashion product claims that it's a good brand, but it's not from Italy or any other renowned uh, country in that aspect, then international customers will be reluctant to buy product of that brand. So the brands, the country of origin also emerged very important in modern times important aspects of success in international markets. Similarly, companies own strategies, programs also became very crucial because business is a complex affair. Business of a large firm is a more complex affair and business of an international or multinational firm is even more complex affair requiring many, many activities and only adopting appropriate strategy over time will allow firms to deliver the type of value which will make them successful. The concept of product life cycle, that all products go through a life cycle stage that will influence success of certain products and at the same time also influence the direction of trade. That which countries firms or what type of countries firms can be more successful in a certain product category also depends on the product life cycle stage which we are going to see later on. So these firm based aspects become very important 
in as far as success in domestic and international markets were concerned. And our previous theories, which we had discussed in last lecture and, and, and sort of uh, 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 in earlier part of this lecture, failed to comprehend this aspect and hence failed to provide a total explanation of success, especially if the firms belong to the same country, same environment, which have same policies, but then some firms are more successful than others. So we really have to bring in the aspect of the firm in order to sharpen our explanation of success and failures in international markets. So the product life cycle theory contends that products essentially go through a life cycle stage. There is always an infancy and growth stage for a new product, new to the world product. In our own lifetimes, we have seen many new products coming and hitting the market. In my lifetime, I have seen television coming for the first time when I was very young. There were no TVs and suddenly the TV came and really revolutionized the way we live, our lifestyles, the way we behave and our consumption. Exciting product. Then came VCRs. Unthinkable before that to, to have an idea that we can have a movie going on or a theater in our own home. Very exciting product this VCR was. And there was immense competition between rival technologies. And then came computers to our lives. And really in early 80s, there were hardly any personal computers in our homes. And suddenly, personal computer became an essential item. And today, well, many of us just cannot survive a day without having a computer in our life. Walkmans, CDs, DVDs, and then a mobile phone. In early 90s, very expensive to have a mobile phone, only very privileged and affluent and prosperous people could afford one. But look at today. Without having a mobile phone, it's very difficult to connect with even our own families. These products have come in and revolutionized the way we live, changed the way we live, changed our life altogether. But these products go through life cycle stages. And according to life cycle theory, in this stage of inception and growth, the products are mostly made and consumed in the markets where they are conceptualized. So when computer came for the first time, before 1980s, I am talking about, computers were already in existence, the personal computers and other computers in early part of the century. And personal computers were available and were being used in homes in as early as 60s and 70s, but in United States and other advanced countries only. So the use of these advanced products were mostly limited to the same countries, to the home countries where they were conceptualized because the firms got an idea from the immediate environment. They identified the need in the immediate environment and they had the capabilities in those environments to create products that could fulfill the local immediate need and the products were created. So mostly during the early growth and infancy stage, the products are manufactured and sold in the same markets where they were conceptualized. In the case of technology product, they are mostly the advanced countries. But then as the products move towards growth further down the life cycle. Then these products are also manufactured and traded among advanced countries, especially technology products. So their manufacturing and their selling is mostly in the similar advanced countries, similar advanced markets where there is similarity of needs, similarity of markets. But then as these products and their industries move towards maturity, there are cost pressures, 
as prices come down and the margins are low. And as we had discussed earlier on in theory of comparative advantage, that eventually in advanced nations, firms have to pursue or have to move towards those technologies and areas where they can have high value additions. But as product moves towards maturity, the value addition opportunity really reduces. So when that happens, there is no choice but to move the manufacturing of these products and services towards less developed countries where it is cheaper to produce these products. So during maturity stage, we can see that production of such products shifts from advanced countries, industrialized countries to less developed countries because of the cost pressures. But then consumption of these products and services is also in advanced countries and starts to pick up in less developed countries. So now the trade pattern shifts. In the earlier stages, the production and consumption is in the same country where the product is conceptualized. As it moves towards higher growth, then the production and trade of the product expands and moves towards other industrialized countries. As the product moves towards maturity, its production shifts towards less developed countries because there it is cheaper to manufacture. And from there it is exported towards more advanced countries. But then if product moves towards the decline stage, that is where normally there is less if any demand in advanced countries. The product is mostly manufactured and sold and traded in less developed countries. So this product life cycle theory tries to explain the pattern of flow of trade as product moves through the life cycle stage. And a very nice and effective theory to explain many types of products, especially those products which neatly follow a product life cycle. So we could see when perhaps VCR came, many of us would be very young, or mobile phone came into our life. The production initially was only in advanced countries and industrialized countries. But now we see increasingly production of these products is moving from advanced countries to less developed countries. And these products are being consumed not only in less developed countries where they are also produced, but also exported towards more advanced countries from less developed countries. In 1980, Paul Krugman proposed his theory of firm strategy and rivalry, which brings in firm aspect very, very strongly. That firms, especially large established firms, also undertake a lot of steps and measures to ensure that they remain successful. These firms invest into their growth, they invest into their scale economies, these firms invest into patents and copyrights, into research and development. These firms invest into creating barriers to entry for other firms. So the success then is very much limited to these firms in the international market because these firms have struggled to strengthen themselves over time. In today's time, we see certain firms which are very strong, very successful, multinationals, international firms, which have invested into their growth, into their scale economies, into development of their technology and institutional skills, into development of innovations protected by patents and copyrights, into development of their brands, customer loyalty, and so on and so forth. So there is a demand of their products. And certain capabilities cannot be acquired by other firms or cannot be transferred to other firms. Very often we have an idea that if we want to expand into certain area our capabilities, we can just recruit some of the talented people from other firms. Well, that is only partially possible. Because capabilities exist at two levels. One at individual level, where there is individual skills and knowledge. But then lot of capabilities are at institutional level. That people together with the systems and other people in that organization are able to create the final products and services. So the skills and capabilities don't just exist at individual level. They also essentially in today's complex world exist at institutional level. Hence within the firm and they cannot be traded, they cannot be transferred. So these firms 
which are successful, have invested very strongly to create entry barriers for other firms in one way or another. So then, where would the success go in the international markets? The success goes where these firms go. Because they are so strong, they are so competent. Products will be successful which they sell. Only they are capable to create state of the art products, most successful products. Only they are able to create best brands. Only they are able to market their products very strongly. Only they are able to achieve very high level of institutional capabilities. So success is not a traded commodity because the firms have created barriers to entry in industries through investment and proper planning and through development over time. So these theories try to explain the aspect of firms' own competitiveness and firms' own capabilities which a firm develops over time. Now we are seeing now two sets of theories. One is about the country's environment. The earlier theories tried to explain what type of environment is required to help firms succeed internationally in international markets. If something is missing from that environment, then firms may not succeed. But then, in today's time, the firms have also become very important that they have to continually invest into their own skills and capabilities and strategies and innovations and, and, and erect barriers to entry through patents, copyrights, branding, achieving customer loyalty and so on and so forth. So now, there are two types of factors which really ensure a firm success in international markets. The country-based factors and of course the firm-based factors. There comes in Michael Porter in 1980 with his famous theory of national competitive advantage. He extensively studied firms and industries of countries around the world which were successful internationally. And he tried to explain and understand what were the factors that contributed towards the success. And he identified these two types of factors, the country-based factors and also the firm-based factors. And in his theory, he proposed four aspects that are very critical in determining the success of any nation or firm of any nation to succeed in international markets. And he identified these four factors which are required to be fulfilled in order to achieve success in international markets. And the first factor was the factor condition that in the country of origin or the host country, there have to be abundance of essential factors of production corresponding to any chosen industry. It is similar to factor proportion theory which we had studied earlier in the theory of comparative advantage. So according to Michael Porter, he had found that in case of firms that were successful and the countries that were able to create successful firms in certain industry that these countries had abundance of essential factors of production. So from developing countries, such exports would succeed or such firms would succeed which would be in labor intensive areas because labor is cheaply available in developing countries. And from oil producing countries, petrochemical based firms would be more successful. And from industrialized countries, technology firms would be more successful. Modern service firms would be more successful from industrialized countries because there the skills, the human skills and the institutional skills that are required 
for today's modern and complex service provision are available. You can take example of hotel industry. Many of the western firms are very successful in hotel industry. They are going around the world through their management contracts managing worldwide chains of hotels. Many of these European, many of these are American firms. Hotel is a hospitality industry. It requires skills which are trained into hospitality industry, into culinary skills and of course in hospitality skills in terms of concept, concepts, capabilities and of course technologies, information technologies, other technologies which are essentially required in today's modern hotels. So to construct and to manage and to efficiently and effectively run modern hotels requires very superior technologies and superior skills that are in abundance available in many advanced countries because these businesses were thriving there. And hence we see worldwide the firms which are successful in hotel and hospitality industry are originating from such countries where such industry to start with was successful. And hence abundance of technology and skills in those areas. Similarly, in financial services sector, we often see firms from United Kingdom and USA very successful because they had the financial hubs, large financial markets in their own countries. So a lot of knowledge and expertise really developed and a lot of technology is also developed to support financial services industry in those countries. And firms then from these countries are more successful globally because they have access to these abundant resources in their own countries. So it's essential to have those factors of production. If those factors of production are not available in abundance, then it will be very difficult for firms to achieve the level of success and efficiency and effectiveness in those respective industries. The second important factor is the demand conditions in the home countries. Really, the firms have to first develop their knowledge, skills, brands, capabilities and sophistication based on the domestic market. If a firm which cannot succeed in the domestic market, how can this firm succeed in international markets? Because international markets are much more competitive and sophisticated than domestic markets. So if we really see the history of successful multinational firms or international firms, they were first successful in their home countries. There they developed their capabilities, their brand, their skills, their technologies and their capital resources. And then they were able to move into international markets and were successful in international markets. But first, they have to develop, they have to groom, they have to succeed in domestic markets. But then if the sophistication of domestic market is very low, then these firms will never have an opportunity to develop sophisticated products and services because the demands of local markets are not that sophisticated. So we see sophisticated multinational mostly emerging from advanced countries. The reason is their own domestic market are advanced, they are sophisticated. So these firms started off with their domestic markets, enhanced their competencies and sophistication level and technological competence and then they were able to sell successfully to international market. So it's essential requirement to have a sophisticated large domestic market for the type of industry which a firm or a nation want to groom for expansion in international markets. So Pakistan has this opportunity for textile industry, but very unfortunately our local demand, our domestic demand in textile industry has not been very sophisticated. Hence we are finding problems that our firms are finding it difficult to move into higher value added areas like garment manufacturing and, and, and knitwear manufacturing. The reason is our local market is not sophisticated enough in that, in that consumption. So local firms don't have that demand and hence do not develop the capabilities to produce sophisticated products and services in these areas. And hence, they are not able to move successfully international markets, which is even more sophisticated and advanced. So if we want our textile firms to successfully move into international arena with their higher value added products, then it is paramount first to enhance the sophistication and the demand 
of such products in our domestic markets. The third factor which is required essentially are related and supporting industries. Well, today's complex world, no one fund can master all the value chain that is needed to deliver the final product. Really many firms have to come together to manufacture one automobile. Tens of thousands of firms have to come together to successfully develop a final product that's a car. Somebody is making wheels, somebody is revolving rubber, somebody is in steel making, somebody is in, in, in dye making, somebody is in electronics, somebody is chemical, in paints, in leather and so on and so forth, in plastics. So huge number of various types of firms have to come together to create one product. So without related and supporting industry, no one firm can be successful. So it is essential for a country to develop a whole value chain, a whole spectrum of related and supporting industry for its firms to succeed in that area in international markets. And fourth factor, of course, is firms' own internal factors, its own investment into its strategies, into its competence, into its innovations, its brand building, and so on and so forth. So Michael Porter brought together these two aspects in his theory, the aspects of a country and its markets and the aspect of firm. And together he had tried to provide a more comprehensive explanation as to what it takes in today's time for firms of any country to succeed in international markets. So they have to be appropriate abundance and quality of factors of production. Number one. Number two, there has to be large and sophisticated domestic market for those type of products to help firms build their competence and capabilities. Third, a comprehensive array of relating and supporting industries have to be established because to deliver final product, to manufacture final product, a number of firms have to come together, have to link together to develop the final product. If these firms are not coming together or related industry is not there, one firm then cannot efficiently and effectively produce the final product. And fourth, the firms themselves have to invest into proper planning, proper strategy, proper innovation, proper R&D, proper brand building and so on and so forth. So in these two lectures, today's and previous lectures, we discussed the previous knowledge to inform ourselves what it takes to create firms that can succeed in international markets. And the aspects we had discussed are not just essential from the perspectives of managers who will be working in these multinational international firms, but also from the aspects of, of people, how they should develop, educate and groom themselves to become relevant to today's world. And also for the policy makers, there what sort of policies and environments are required to facilitate to ensure that local firms are increasingly successful in international markets. Because for today's time, a country has no choice but to prosper economically if it has to survive as a nation in today's world. Thank you for that.